Hey listeners, this is Ben, the Amateur Exegete, and you're listening to episode 31 of Bible Study for Amateurs. Today's episode is, Without Excuse, Is Paul Referring to Atheists in Romans 1? In episode 9, we looked at Psalm 14, verse 1, a text sometimes weaponized by Christians to be used against unbelievers, and we asked whether the author of that psalm had atheists in mind when referring to people who said there was no God as fools. Spoiler alert, that isn't what he was doing. Today, I want to look at another text that is often used by Christians against atheists, Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Here is that verse as it appears in the New Revised Standard Version. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things he has made. So they are without excuse. Here is the late R.C. Sproul, a Calvinist and popular Bible teacher, using Romans chapter 1 verse 20 as a springboard for a discussion about unbelievers. What excuse is the apostle pulling away from the atheist here? The one excuse that every atheist, that every agnostic will want to use on the final day of judgment is the excuse of ignorance. God, I didn't know you were there. If I just would have known, I would have believed you, I would have followed you, I would have obeyed you. What's worse than hardcore atheism is allegedly softcore atheism, which goes under the guise of agnosticism. The agnostic says, I'm not going to say there is no God, I just simply don't know whether there's a God, because I don't think there's sufficient evidence to come to a conclusion one way or the other. That terrifies me when I hear somebody say that. I say, because what you're saying now is not only you're not willing to affirm the existence of God, but you are pinning the blame of that unwillingness on God himself for not giving you sufficient information. Be careful here. You are adding insult to injury. If this is true, then what it is saying here is that God has so clearly clearly manifested himself ever since the creation of the world through everything that is made that you can never use ignorance as an excuse before God. My apologies to you agnostics. It looks like you are in really big trouble come Judgment Day. Despite its usage among many a Bible teacher in pulpits and even classrooms around the world, we should ask ourselves whether this is something Paul intended in this text. Does Paul mean to attack atheists here? I don't think so. Before I explain why, let me be clear that I'm sure Paul would have loathed atheists, but I doubt he encountered many over the course of his career. Though there were certainly atheists in Greco-Roman antiquity, It's doubtful that they represented a significant portion of the population. Robert Garland, in his book Daily Life of the Ancient Greeks, writes, Very few Greeks were what we would call atheists. He also notes that agnosticism was far more common than atheism. A similar conclusion is reached by historian Marek Weinjergic in his book Diagoras of Melas, a contribution to the history of ancient atheism. Though there were those in ancient Greece who rejected theism generally, and polytheism particularly, he writes that this atheism was limited to a small group of people, and the majority of society remained faithful to the religion of their polis, that is, their city. Paul was far more likely to run into people who believed gods existed, 
than to find anyone who thought that there were none at all. In fact, in the earliest extant letter we have by Paul, the first epistle to the Thessalonians, the apostle commends his non-Jewish audience, writing in chapter 1 verse 9 that they turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Thessalonica, like most Greco-Roman cities, was awash with deities, so much so that historian Paula Fredrickson remarks in her book, Paul, the Pagan's Apostle, it was impossible to live in a Greco-Roman city without living with its gods. That brings us to our verse in Romans chapter 1. It should probably go without saying that Paul's target audience is a group living in the city of Rome, the capital of the empire. Were there atheists living there? Probably. But what was his audience more likely to encounter? Atheism or polytheism? Why, polytheism, of course. Paul, as a Jew living in the first century, viewed the whole of humanity as being in one of two camps. Jews and, in Greek, ethne, nations, or as in many English translations, Gentiles. The former worshipped the true God, whereas the latter worshipped the wrong ones. As I mentioned earlier, Paul in 1 Thessalonians commends his audience for turning to God from idols. In verse 10 of chapter 1, he also notes that they wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. But why would God bring wrath upon the world? The connection to idolatry seems instructive. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, Paul tells his readers that God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness. Whence such ungodliness and wickedness? The verses that follow give us the answer. The nations knew of the true God, but failed to honor or thank him. And, here's the key, verse 23 reports that they exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being, or birds, or four-footed animals, or reptiles. In his commentary on Romans, Frank Matera writes, Although Paul is speaking of Gentile idolatry, he employs language that evokes Moses' warning to Israel not to make an idol of any kind. The passage to which Matera refers can be found in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 15 through 20, and in it Moses tells the people to not make any idol that resembles a human or an animal. Their allegiance is to Yahweh alone, a deity who cannot and should not be depicted in any way. What is the result of such idolatry? That brings about God's wrath. In verses 24 and 25, Paul claims that sexual immorality is caused by idolatry because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator. And not just sexual immorality, but, per verse 29, every kind of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, including envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness, making them gossips, slanderers, god-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious towards parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Boy, that's a mouthful. In the words of Pamela Eisenbaum, in her wonderful book, Paul was not a Christian, the original message of a misunderstood apostle. According to the Jewish view of the world, idolatry is the sin that leads to all other sins. Later in that book, she observes, Paul believes that, on the whole, Gentiles are depraved on account of idolatry. So, Paul isn't addressing atheism. 
in Romans chapter 1. It's not even on his radar. He's addressing idolatry, which, by its nature, implicitly acknowledges and explicitly demonstrates a belief in divine beings. That ain't atheism. The they of Romans chapter 1 verse 20 are pagans who worshipped the wrong gods. That's all the time we've got this week. See you next time. And remember, in the words of Richard Elliot Friedman, one does not need to deny what is troubling about the Bible in order to pay respect to what is heartening. Thanks for listening.